Well, welcome to the Lunch and Society today with James Curtis. The biography is his biography on Buster Keaton, a filmmaker's life. For those who haven't been here before, what the Lunch and Society is, is a well, before the, uh, the pandemic, was a series of lunches and dinners and private gatherings in New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and, and um, Boston. Since the pandemic, we've, we've gone online. We feel very comfortable online. But what we are going to be having scheduling soon will be some gatherings uh, in San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York, and all places where we tend to be. So we're looking at that. We should have it soon. That'll be very cool. It's good to see some old friends we haven't seen in a while. Mm -hmm. And again, I, I think what's exciting is that, you know, there, right now there are two, there's a there is a new appreciation for Buster Keaton and his, and his contributions to cinema. There are two books out. We think we got the best of the two of them here today with James. So we're excited <laughs> about that. And what's fun is that is what, what strikes me about um, the book is that is that how is that at the end of the day, talent wins. And, and when you look at what Keaton was able to bring to the silent era, he was one of the few people to actually transmit it into the, in, into the era of the talkies and had a career that went as far and in, literally into, into the William Asher movies in, in, into the 60s. And to his credit, even though he went through some difficult times, he still, he still remained true to his art. And I, I think you see that throughout, um, the, throughout his book. And I think you see that throughout Buster's life as well. So with that, we'll kick it off to, to James Curtis, We'll tee up the book for about five to 10 minutes, and then we'll dive into Q&As after that. James, you're up. Oh, thank you, Bob. Um, actually, what you say is true about Buster Keaton. He was working up until two months before he died uh, at the age of 70. So uh, he was uh, a powerful guy in terms of uh, stamina, physical and otherwise, as he uh, demonstrated in many of his films. Uh, I think also uh, the thing that distinguished him to me at least, is the realization of how much he did behind the camera. When I first discovered him, I didn't understand any of that, of course, and hence the title, Buster Keaton, A Filmmaker's Life. I want to put more emphasis in this book on what he did behind the camera, in effect, and the amount of control he exerted on his great films, uh, how he brought them about, uh, and really the, the breadth and scope of his involvement. Uh, in the entertainment uh, profession, going back to being born in a medicine show in 1895. Uh, from that, he progressed on to uh, vaudeville in a big way, and from there to silent pictures in 1917, talkies in 1930, and uh, television in 1949. So he pretty much uh, spanned all modern entertainment media going up to, uh, well, practically the present day. He never streamed, but uh, other than that, uh, uh, he was involved in a little bit of everything. And so it's a story that has uh, uh, a lot of background to it in terms of the various uh, uh, developments over the decades and uh, how he formed a prominent place in, in the middle of those things. Uh, sometimes uh, after a while, sometimes initially and then not later. Uh, but he was, I think, a brilliant instinctively gifted man in terms of uh, rendering what he did on screen. Uh, people think of him as the great stone face, uh, the pork pie hat and the string tie, and uh, a guy who uh, uh, cut a distinctive figure uh, in front of the camera. And so I wanted to shine a big spotlight on uh, what he did behind. And that goes to also writing, conceiving, having his own studio, and really doing the same thing, essentially, that uh, his uh, uh, peers did, meaning Charlie Chaplin and Harold Lloyd back in the uh, 20s, especially. And uh, I think his body of work is second to none. And uh, I think that uh, his skill as a filmmaker uh, is self-evident in that respect, but also in terms of how he put uh, across on camera a very distinctive uh, look that is unlike anybody else's. And to this, to this day, 50 years, more than half a century after his death, uh, I think he's probably more popular than ever. And uh, so it's a rather unique story and one that I was glad I was able to do uh, to the length that it deserved. 
so uh, with that, do we go to convert? Yeah, we'll just go to something. Why, I mean, my question is when you look back and um, maybe Jeff can actually chime in on a little bit of this too, because he because of his involvement in, um, in the genre. We look back at Chaplin, you look back at Keaton. Why was it that those who were involved in comedy and or slapstick were in fact able to translate their talents in front of the screen, behind the screen? What made them different? Well, I think a sense of self for one thing. All these guys started on the stage initially, and so uh, they had to develop personas that doesn't necessarily depend upon technology. Uh, once they brought those to film or in front of, to the camera medium, uh, it became so, a question of how do you adapt what you've developed and made successful on stage to what, what goes on screen. And when you see the early Buster Keaton appearances on screen, meaning the, the Fatty Arbuckle comedies that he started to do in New York in 1917, you can see some of his stage business. He's bringing that because he really is still getting used to being photographed the way he was. Uh, after about three films, you see that uh, stuff go away pretty much. And what remains is uh, his gradual and developing understanding of how the film medium works. And by the time R. Buckle and company pulled up stakes in New York and came out to California, not far from uh, where we are now, where I am anyway, which is Long Beach. Um, he was essentially more sophisticated than most uh, directors in terms of what he understood about the camera, what you could do with the camera. He knew, for instance, that, well, if you look at R. Buckle's work, for instance, and I'll use him as an example because he was a very popular comic in his day, uh, very commercially successful. And Arbuckle did a lot of things, if you look at his films, that he could easily do on stage. He could do things like juggle butcher knives and the like, and he would do that in the kitchen scene, for instance. Well, you can do that on stage just as well. Buster would take whole trains and construct gags around them. You know, he, he understood that you could take the camera and take it places that you couldn't show on stage. And so he had an idea of how to use that capability to make funny films. And I think that was probably the real difference between uh, Buster and everyone else is that he had such a, a gift and it was, wasn't taught to him. He picked it up, but he also, I think, had, uh, had the mind of a civil engineer, you could say. Um, I, knew, I knew an assistant director who worked on two films with Chaplin. Uh, his name was Eddie Sutherland. He became a director himself later. And he said Chaplin didn't know the difference between a one-inch lens and a two-inch lens. He didn't know anything about the camera whatsoever. Buster Keaton could take the camera apart and put it back together again. That's the difference. Okay, so uh, before we go on, uh, to those who want to, we're going to form a queue in the chat function at the bottom. Just throw your name into the, into the pile. Ron Young, you're up, and you're on mute right now. You're on mute. Thanks. There you go. Jim, thanks very much for giving us a quick recap of Buster Keaton. So how was he different? Can you help us understand how he was different from his peers, his contemporaries in the game? Well, again, I think that he was more suited to directing films than the others. Uh, Chaplin was a good director, I say, of Chaplin. As far as Chaplin was concerned, the center of interest was, was, was wherever he was on screen. Um, Harold Lloyd had other directors. Harold Lloyd was a good producer of his films, but not necessarily a good director. He needed a lot of help in order to do what he did. Um, Keaton was different in the sense that he had a firm grasp. Keaton could have directed films in any genre he cared to, and not necessarily with him. Uh, in fact, Ch Harold Lloyd in later years uh, confided to a mutual friend of theirs that he wanted Buster to direct him in early talkies and Buster would never do it. Uh, I think Buster was res reticent. He was uh, 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 very shy and modest in his own way. And uh, he wouldn't presume to do that. And this is during some of Buster's darkest years. Uh, but that's the esteem that he was held in by his peers is, is that Harold Lloyd was willing to say, I want Buster to direct me. Uh, at the end of his life, he was supposed to direct Danny Kaye on CBS, and uh, he didn't live to do that, but that was all set up and ready to go when he died. And what was the business model? How did he make money, and what were the size of the budgets in those days? 
Well, he was strictly salaried, which is not the case with Harold Lloyd and Chaplin. They own their stuff and uh, they pretty much ran their own uh, studios. Uh, Buster did not have a good business head. Uh, his concern was solely being able to pay the bills and make films. And he thought and dreamed about them. Uh, he said one time that uh, uh, it was really a 24 hour a day sort of job during his peak, that uh, there was always something going on. He was always writing himself notes. Uh, he, he was in that respect, the total filmmaker. Here's a question, um, and again, throw your uh, those who in the chat part. Looking back at the at the stunts, this is water, we, incidentally. Oh, sure it is. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's it's it, while it's a little earlier on the West Coast. I'm I'm not saying anything. Oh, but here's right. a question: It goes to the danger of some of the stunts, not only by not only by um, Keaton himself, but uh, looking at Harold Lloyd and some of the other folks. The extreme danger, and we're talking about houses falling or fronts of houses falling and landing perfectly. On. And, and how, how do you, how are you able to calculate the, the, the danger and keep it funny at the same time? Because if, because if there was, if, there, if a house was going to fall on me, you've got one take mm -hmm. to make it happen right. I wouldn't be looking for the laugh. I'd be, I'd be scared crapless making sure I'm not, you know, yeah. killed by this falling house that's going to fall on top of me. Yeah. How, well, it, oh, I'm sorry, go on. How is Kate, Keaton able to do that? I don't think he thought about it that much. Um, as far as he was concerned, the gag was the gag. If it involves some danger, uh, the correct way to pull off the gag is not to get killed. Uh, if you were to get injured or killed, then uh, the gag didn't work. And... Buster was a consummate professional when it came to things like that. I think there was also uh, an element of honor involved in what he did. I can use another example, which is uh, W.C. Fields, uh, about whom I wrote an earlier book. And uh, he started out as a juggler, as we all know. And he considered it a point of honor that he would not kid a trick, a juggling trick, that he could not legitimately do. He, he, he intended and, and strove to master. Here's the definition of athleticism, the physical qualities that are characteristic. Sorry, no, I, I caught it. Go ahead, keep okay. going. <laughs> um, okay, Marcia. <laughs> anyway, uh, the, um, what were we talking about? Oh, yeah. Uh, anyway, Fields could not uh, abide uh, uh, people who couldn't, couldn't do the tricks in that case or people who, who kidded things and couldn't do it legitimately. Uh, I saw a letter one time he wrote to his brother and Fields was suggesting he could become a performer also. And he mentioned the letter, a guy who was in vaudeville at that time and he billed himself as the world's laziest juggler. And his act consisted of coming out on stage with plates and bric-a-brac of various sorts. He would throw them up in the air and they would crash to the stage floor. And that was his act. And Fields had utter contempt for this guy because he couldn't juggle. And, uh, uh, and I think Buster felt the same way. Uh, he, it was important that he do a gag in one take in a lot of cases because that's where the laugh is. Uh, the timing was pulled off as such. At one, one time he was doing a shot in his first feature, which is called Three Ages, and Wallace Beery is throwing rocks at him. And at one point, uh, Buster takes a, a, a club, they're cavemen in this thing, takes a club and he t uses the club like a baseball bat and bats the stone, the, the, the rock back. It's actually kind of a small boulder, it's about like this. Bat bats it back into Wallace Beery's stomach, which disables him and he can get away. Well, they, they did something like 85 takes of that to get it right. And they could have easily have cut, done it in multiple uh, uh, shots, but Keaton would not do that. It was important that it be done in one shot and that the frame of the shot was correct so you could see everything. Um, another example I can use, of course, also is that Keaton often insisted that he be photographed in full figure. The reason for that is interesting if you watch his stuff a lot. Uh, you'll see that he doesn't necessarily emote with his face. Although he would smile and laugh in the Arbuckle comedies. He stopped doing that later. Uh, 
but he he tells you more about what he's feeling and thinking with his entire body and that's why he had to be shot full frame full figure i should say um other comedians didn't work that way a lot of them worked with their faces primarily and maybe some sort of a, a distinctive costume like chaplin chaplin was more physical than some of them i think uh, but Buster was one that was communicating a lot more with the stance, uh, how he carried himself, the way he used his entire body. Lisa, you're up. Lisa Angler. Hi. Jim, I find it fascinating that you say um, like he knew the inner workings of the camera and to give him that perspective um, for directing. Do you, mm -hmm. do you find that that perspective on the mechanics played over into any of his other work, like his comedic work or? Well, I'll tell you where that mindset comes into play is when he's breaking down the elements of a gag. Um, there's a documentary film, wonderful documentary film was made in the 1960s when he was doing a film up in Canada and they captured an argument he had with the director of the film who was still alive incidentally. And uh, the the idea was that the, the gag was some had something to do with this high trestle and Keaton was supposed to motor across this trestle, single track situation up in Canada, and uh, proceed to uh, get tangled up in an enormous map so that, in effect, he would uh, uh, not see the danger he was in when he was struggling with this mm -hmm. map. And uh, so uh, the director is explaining the shot to him, but Keaton's not buying it. And, he's, and the director says at one point, well, we have this shot of the bridge that we haven't taken yet. And, and Keaton gets impatient when he says, the bridge is not your gag. The bridge is suspense. And I heard him say that. And I thought, and I was a kid at the time. And I thought, this guy's the Hitchcock of comedy. He can break down these things into their essential elements. And that's, a, that's a, an engineer's mind for you. And I, I think it's interesting that he had that kind of mind. At the same time, he was reared from the age of three to be a comedian. Uh, you put those two elements together and you get something awfully unique. Yeah, it's fascinating. It's so funny Thank to hear you. the words comedy and engineering in the same right. <laughs> You think that they would be running away from each other. Well, you know, later on when he was at MGM in the 40s and he was being, uh, he was a utility gag man, they would bring him in to uh, advise on certain things they wanted to do in films. And Keaton would spend his time in his office when he wasn't needed uh, with erector sets. And he would build these elaborate Rube Goldberg style uh, mechanisms to do ridiculous things like uh, crack nuts or uh, light a cigarette. And uh, they were actually exhibited up in San Francisco one time, uh, put on display because of their uh, ingenuity. But that's that gives you an idea of what his mind worked. The way with that, we'll, we'll go to Sydney Stern. Sydney, you're up. And you're on mute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to change the subject a second and say something about Jim because I reached out to him when I was working on my book about the Mankiewiczes. I don't know if you remember this, but there was a quote in his book of one of my subjects, Joe. And I wrote to ask the source and he was, I don't know what you were working on. It was your Spencer Tracy biography. I guess so, yeah. Yeah, yeah but you dug back into all those voluminous notes and copied <laughs> what I needed and, and sent it to me. And that's very generous. So I just wanted everybody to know that. Well, thank you, Sydney. I, didn't didn't we do a panel one time somewhere? I met you and the at the bio. You were doing a pot, a panel, and I think Mary maybe Carrie Beecham was there too. Carrie and I came up and introduced cool. myself, and I just wrote you after that. Oh, but you really oh. didn't know me. I was very oh okay curious. okay. Well, yeah, I, I thought we had met, but uh, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Jeff Joseph. You're up. Yeah, um, I was wondering if you could talk about um, how bad MGM wound up being. Uh, for Buster Keaton. I mean, MGM was bad for Laurel and Hardy and the Marx Brothers and Abbott and Costello. They were particularly bad with Buster Keaton. And yeah. I wondered how he reacted to that and, and, and how it changed the course of his career. Well, it, it's, it's the way they were constituted from a managerial standpoint. Um, MGM was the worst studio in Hollywood for comedy. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that part of the reason was that it was a producer controlled situation. In other words, uh, the producers had ultimate uh, authority over the uh, all aspects of the creative process. Um, a studio like Paramount was constituted for comedy. They had the Marx Brothers, they had WC Fields, they had uh, any number of people, Jack Oakey, et cetera. Um, 
MGM really didn't have star comedians. Uh, they made funny films occasionally. Later on, they made the Marx Brothers films when Thalberg brought them over. But uh, uh, at that point, not really. So, uh, and, and Mayer was very strong about that. He, he would take a new producer and, you know, un, under his uh, wing, so to speak, and he would say, now, remember, this is a producer-driven studio. And uh, uh, you've got to exert your authority. You've got to understand that, uh, reassert that whenever possible. And unfortunately, he did this with Thalberg's new brother-in-law, whose name was Lawrence Weingarten. And Weingarten started out doing Westerns. He was a publicity guy initially. And it could be argued that he had no sense whatsoever of what Buster Keaton's character was like how he, he never studied Buster Keaton's successful films to see what made them successful. He was not an analytical guy in that respect at all. Uh, so Thalberg, uh, who was in charge of all production at MGM at that time, which meant, you know, 45, 50 feature films a year, uh, brilliant guy from a, a story sense, but Thalberg was not a comedy mind. Uh, he made things like the Barrett's of Wimple Street or uh, Camille, those, those were Thalberg films. Uh, uh, so it was tough for him to get his arms around what a comedian like Buster Keaton did, A and B, how he did it. And the way he did it was they would shoot and they would shoot, they would shoot, then they would go out and put the film before an, a live audience, take notes, go back, do retakes, do new stuff, take it out again, go back, do more retakes, et cetera. They didn't do that really with the dramas to any great extent. And so uh, just by their very nature, feature comedies were more expensive to do than uh, other kinds of very profitable films. Uh, I can give you an example. Uh, a Keaton comedy like oh, The Cameraman, which was his first film at MGM, it was done pretty much the way he normally did work. And it was one of his great films. Uh, the Cameraman cost about $350,000 to make. And it didn't return much of a profit because it was so expensive uh, to make. Uh, by, the, by the same token, you had a very profitable uh, uh, property in Lon Chaney at that time who would make these lurid melodramas. They can make a Lon Chaney picture for $150,000 and they would knock out for a year and they would routinely return $750,000 to a million dollars a piece. So they, they were very profitable uh, enterprises. Uh, Greta Garbo back in the silent days, same way. You know, they, they could make a film with her for $170,000. It would return $500,000, $600,000. Um, Buster didn't have that kind of an audience and his films were more expensive. So um, the double whammy there besides sound coming into play, which meant that the films that were made were more expensive to make. Um, but at the same time, uh, you had somebody in charge who was being told, get the cost of his features down at, all, at uh, any way you possibly can. Now, Thalberg was the producer, the official producer on the second film, which is called Spite Marriage, which was Buster's last silent feature. Um, but Thalberg had a lot of responsibilities and he didn't understand comedy very well. So he turned the Buster Keaton comedies over to Larry Weingarten. And that was a marriage made in hell. Uh, Weingarten, if he produced a good Buster Keaton film, it was entirely an accident. And so Thalberg on the second comedy that they made, a talking comedy, which was called uh, Doughboys, he told, Wein, uh, he, he told Weingarten to back off and give Buster space. And Buster turned in a pretty good film, a pretty good talkie that kind of pointed the way forward, even though he was drinking at that time because his marriage was falling apart. Um, there were a lot of complexities that work into the MGM situation, but essentially he was saddled with a producer who didn't understand him. And his life was uh, in a spiral at that point. He was drinking. Uh, there were a lot of things wrong there. And then Thalberg, on top of everything, had a heart attack, took him out of the studio for 10 months. And during that time, Louis B. Mayer, who Keaton was convinced had no sense of humor whatsoever, uh, took the opportunity to fire Buster Keaton, and that's how it ended in 1933. Thanks. Marsha, you're up. Marsha Rose, you're on mute. Okay. There you Hi. Go. I, I'm 
I'm so fascinated with this. I was just curious, you know, there's no trick photography at the time. And I was just curious as an original person, like how his childhood molded him when you said he was starting at age three. Mm-hmm. Confidence to not continue, but to do something original. He was so agile. I was just so curious about how he moved on and like his childhood. I was just curious how it influenced his ability to do something like this. Well, it, the three Keatons was the family act that he uh, grew into. Uh, he was with them as early as the age of three, but he didn't join them full time until he had turned five years of age. And uh, the act evolved slowly, but uh, in, a, in a very good way from the standpoint of uh, improving its quality. Um, what they started out with, the mother and the father, Joe Keaton and his wife, Myra, was kind of a, a hybrid act. Myra would come out and sing and play instruments. Joe would do jazzy things on top of a table. And I know this sounds silly, but um, he would have a table and chairs on top of the table. And he would do very agile uh, uh, things like, for instance, he would be able to jump up onto the table from the floor. Uh, He would uh, move from one uh, chair to the other. He would stack the chairs one on top of another, uh, move around between barrels, you know, that sort of thing. And as odd as it sounds, this was actually a class of act in vaudeville at that time that, that was known as silence and fun. And what it was is graceful movements, kind of like, eh, I don't want to say Fred Astaire necessarily, but it was an interesting act and it involved acrobatics that were self-taught to a large extent. Um, it wasn't a great act when it was just the two parents. So when they brought Buster in at the age of five, they thought, well, what are we going to do with him? And Joe got the idea because Joe Joe started out doing blackface when he was on the medicine show circuit, but he gave that up very early. And uh, he settled into what was described at the time as a rough Irish specialty. Right. And so he, he, he wore this um, outlandish makeup, a bald cap and uh, 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 whiskers and uh, uh, an, an Irish costume of sorts or a stereotypical Irish costume back in the days when we were a nation of immigrants. And so he decided, well, let's dress Buster up the same way. So Buster is like a little version of him. And Buster was small for his age even. Uh, when, he, when he was fully grown as an adult, he was five, six. But earlier on, he, he, he got away with playing a child a lot longer than he could have if he had grown normally. Um, so anyway, the idea was that Joe Keaton would come out, start to do his normal act, and Buster would come out from the wings carrying a broom. And he would be behind Joe so Joe wouldn't see him. And he'd sweep the broom across the top of the table, knock Joe off his uh, feet and onto the floor. Then he'd turn around and run off very quickly. And so the battle was joined at that point. So the rest of the act was Joe trying to do his admittedly somewhat dull act and Buster doing whatever he could to disrupt it. Um, over time, it got more violent, and uh, it developed to where Buster would, uh, Joe would pick up Buster at some points, and he'd just throw him into the scenery, and uh, or he would throw him like a bowling ball across the stage, that sort of thing. Um, Buster had a specially padded suit uh, that he wore. Uh, these were professionally uh, uh, trained uh, acrobatic uh, maneuvers, uh, and uh, so nobody got hurt, although it was one of the roughest acts, roughest appearing acts in Broadville. Um, but it was a very popular act and it was very funny and it became very quickly one of the standard acts in Broadville. Uh, in some cases, it would run upwards of 20 minutes, which was unheard of at that time for anything other than a headliner. Uh, so that was what he grew up into and he was there until he was 16 years of age and then he went out on his own. But during that time, he could do anything with his body and not injure himself. Thank you. Let's see, Shannon, you're up next. She's on mute. What we'll do, we'll come back to Shannon. Pat O'Brien, you're up. Oh, hi, sorry. Oh, Shannon, you're, you're back. Go ahead, Jerry. Yeah, I just was um, off camera. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, it, 
seems they were uh, he, uh, that he and Charlie Chaplin were the same, same era, and I was wondering how he escaped uh, being caught up in in the communist witch hunts. Well, Keaton wasn't caught up in those at all. Uh, Chaplin right. was probably more progressive politically than Keaton was, although Keaton was pretty apolitical. Uh, I have a suspicion that he was a little more conservative than Chaplin. Uh, uh, he and Chaplin knew and liked each other and respected each other. Uh, and uh, that's on display most uh, uh, obviously in a film that Chaplin made in 1952 called Limelight and about an old uh, music hall uh, act. And uh, at one point toward the end of the film, they want to rec recreate an eight minute segment of one of these acts with Chaplin and one of his old time friends. And it was for a benefit uh, uh, performance in London. And uh, so he chose Buster Keaton to come on stage with him to do this. And Buster was delighted to do it. Um, Keaton's agent, uh, who came on a little bit after this, pointed out to Keaton that Chaplin had kind of lowballed in terms of the uh, fee that he offered him. And Keaton said, I would have done it for free. And uh, Keaton, Keaton did, not, did not need the money at that point. He was doing very well in television, which of course Chaplin would never lure himself to do. But uh, uh, he was very, he had great affection for Chaplin and great respect for Chaplin. So he was basically never a target. No. Yeah. yeah. Walk us through his, uh, uh, Buster's financial fortunes as he moved from youth to middle age to the later years in his life. Because it seemed at one point he was, I saw the picture of the mansion he had mm -hmm. at one point, which was pretty, pretty palatial. And yeah. then obviously his career ebbed. And then one of the good thing, one of the nice stories I heard when the when they did the movie on his life that allowed him to buy a place in the a place in the valley or something to that effect. Woodland Hills, Walk us through. Uh, which he retired to pretty much or uh, as much as he could retire. Uh, they just tore down that house last year, as a matter of fact. But it was a nice ranch style home and it had enough acreage that he could uh, keep chickens and uh, grow crops and uh, the like, and uh, he really liked it out there. It was well suited to him. He had a swimming pool and uh, he rigged the swimming pool with a model train set so that he could serve uh, barbecue and the like out there. And they would, uh, th he had the uh, train set running into the kitchen and uh, they would put food on the uh, various cars. And uh, this was one of those large format, well, I don't remember what they call them, but the these large uh, format trains. And so you'd have hamburgers, you'd have uh, beer, et cetera. And once it was loaded up, he'd send it out to the, to the uh, picnic tables in the backyard by the pool. And uh, so guests would, uh, they'd slow the train down and guests would take off their food, whatever they wanted. And then they'd uh, run the train back into the kitchen for another load. And uh, that's the sort of thing he did around the house, for instance. Um, but yeah, his, his, um, his fortunes really were... Uh, Part of the problem or part of the challenge with telling the Buster Keaton story is the first half of his life is nothing but success, essentially. He's a success in vaudeville. He moves to films. He's a success in films. Uh, and up until 1929, 1930, he's 35 years old in 1930. Um, he, he was making great money. He was making great films. Uh, and it all came tumbling down. As he said one time, there I was on top of a mountain on a toboggan. And uh, so the next few years were miserable in all kinds of ways. Uh, his marriage went bad. Uh, he lost the independence that he had as an independent uh, filmmaker. Uh, he was a salaried employee at MGM. And uh, they had full control of his output. And when he no longer suited him, they cut him loose. Uh, his wife sued him for divorce. Uh, he lost the house. Uh, so you'd, you could say very definitely that the period of the 1930s was hitting uh, bottom, as they say in AA, and then uh, working, building his way back from there. And the thing that really made a big difference to Buster Keaton was his third marriage in 1940. Uh, Eleanor Keaton was everything his previous two wives were not, and she remained with him for the rest of her life. She loved him very much, and uh, I think that she made a big difference in the rest of his life. I don't think that he would have lasted to the age of 70 without Eleanor. And the follow-up, uh, well, it kind of goes into a different direction. 
mm-hmm. you know, when you look at it, when you look at Keaton's classics, they were uh, in, in the early twenties, they were, they were black and white silent mm-hmm. films. And then once, you know, once the talkies emerged, once that became the par for the course, and once film became, began to move to a colorized format, a lot of the silent films were lost or they were not maybe lost, but they were fairly forgotten. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and, you know, in Hollywood, uh, ho- Hollywood can be a brutal place. You're a, you're, you're this year's flavor and you can quickly go to the back of the, back of the uh, bin and be next year's forgotten person. I mean, mm-hmm. and, and it was accentuated with the fact that there were a lot of people within the silent era who just couldn't make it into the talking era because of their accents or because of whatever, whatever impeded them from making the transition. How is, I mean, how is uh, Keaton able to hang in there in a way others couldn't? Well, by sheer talent as much as anything, I think. He, he always had something he could sell. Uh, and in the 1940s, when he couldn't stand making two reelers for Columbia anymore, uh, he walked away from that. He was getting $2,500 a film, uh, and he'd do two or three of those a year. And, uh, you know, whole families were living on less than that back then, um, although he had a family support. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, when he went to MGM, his friend Eddie Mannix at MGM in 1941 and said, I need, I need some income. Uh, they said, okay, okay, fine. So they put him on as a gag man, $100 a week, $400 a month. And uh, he proceeded to, uh, once they realized that he was there and he's, he was valuable, he proceeded to go in and fix things in films. Uh, a lot of times, the, the, the big comedian they had under contract in the 40s was Red Skelton. And so Keaton worked on a lot of Red Skelton films. In fact, Red Skelton remade some of Keaton's silent films, like The Cameraman. Uh, so he always had something he could contribute. And in several cases, he actually uh, got involved in reshooting a feature that didn't work out well and uh, saving it uh, uh, so that they actually took something that was a guaranteed uh, flop and uh, turned it into a moneymaker. Uh, that especially happened on a film that he did with Red Skelton in 1949 called uh, Southern Yankee, uh, where it didn't preview well at all. They knew they had a terrible film on their hands. Uh, they asked Keaton to look at it and see what, what was wrong with it. And he told <clears> them <throat> what was wrong with it, and he went in and he fixed it. And uh, uh, he was partnered at that time with Ed Sedgwick, who had directed all of his MGM talkies. And uh, so Sedgwick took the director's credit on the revision of Southern Yankee. And it's a very funny film and uh, very successful, even with the cost of the retakes. Uh, So he always had something he could sell. And uh, as long as he did, and he was he had the energy to work, he had the desire to work. So into the 50s and 60s, when Chaplin was not working any longer or was out of the country. Harold Lloyd was retired. He, he was sitting around counting his money. And uh, there really wasn't anybody left other than Buster Keaton who had that kind of heritage. He had that kind of experience and he could provide the kind of, um, of um, quality that they're looking for. And that even goes to someone like Billy Wilder who used him as one of the waxworks famously in uh, Sunset Boulevard. Uh, when you think about that scene, It was very important that they had Buster Keaton because Buster Keaton by that point was on a lot of television shows. People were reminded what he looked like. Everybody knew who he was. You wouldn't necessarily look at that scene and say, oh, uh, you know, there's H.B. Warner, who's the other male in that uh, bridge group. Uh, You just wouldn't know who he was, but you would know who Buster Keaton was. Before we go to Pat O'Brien, you had mentioned the name of Eddie Mannix. Yeah. Eddie Mannix, uh, for those who saw the one Coen Brothers movie was come fictionalized. I think by Josh Brolin, mm-hmm. and he was. I'm trying to think who portrayed him in, in Hollywood Land. But what was the relationship between Eddie Mannix and Keaton? Because in many respects, Mannix, while a producer, was seen as a fixer. He was the guy who would go in and clean the problems uh, created by artists or directors or producers within MGM and make sure the stories would go away. Certainly, they make sure that the arrest records would go away, and definitely make sure nothing would show up in the LA Times or the Examiner. <laughs> Well, uh, Mannix was actually for many years the uh, studio manager. He handled union problems, that sort of thing as well. Um, When Buster started at MGM, Mannix was a supervisor, in other words, a producer. And uh, Mannix was the official supervisor on the cameraman. 
which is why it turned out so well because he was a hands-off producer. Uh, but that's the reason it went way over schedule also is because Mannix was hands off. Uh, but they knew each other from the mid twenties. Um, Metro distributed the uh, Buster Keaton features for a long time. And Eddie Mannix was an executive going back to that period. Uh, so they were friendly. And when Buster built the house that he wanted in Beverly Hills and not, not the mansion that still exists, the Italian villa, but he built a nice little two-story house on Linden Drive in Beverly Hills as a surprise for his wife. Well, he designed it himself, essentially. He, 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 a lot of it was uh, his own work in terms of uh, furniture created, that sort of thing. But, but it was a modest by Hollywood movie star standards house. And the wife, of course, hated it. Uh, she didn't like the size of it. She said, where are the servants going to, going to stay, et cetera, et cetera. So he was very deflated. And with him on the big reveal that day because he did it without his wife's knowledge uh, was Eddie Mannix's wife, uh, uh, Bernice. And uh, so he's, she loved the house. And uh, he said, well, show it to Eddie. If he likes it, then I'll sell it to you. And so Eddie Mannix bought the house that Buster Keaton built and uh, lived there uh, for most of the rest of his life. And uh, so the 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 period of time when the Italian villa was built, and it's still there. It's been beautifully restored, incidentally. Uh, was the period when he was, you know, enjoying his success. In fact, he was shooting the General, which uh, by a lot of lights was his greatest uh, feature film, up in um, up in Oregon while the house was being built. Uh, it almost got torn down on several occasions. It was allowed to deteriorate under the ownership of James Mason and his uh, ex-wife, Pamela Mason. And uh, uh, then some spec uh, restorers bought the place and spent a lot of time and money restoring it to his former glory. Mason, unfortunately, uh, subdivided the property. So the expanse of land that Buster had when he owned the house had been whittled away. And one of the things that happened was that uh, the house lost the swimming pool. The swimming pool was subdivided into another lot. And there was another house built to be used with the pool. Um, recently, like say in the last five years, uh, the widow of the guy that built the house that had the swimming pool died herself. The house became available and the people who now own uh, the Italian villas paid $15 million to acquire that house so they get the pool back. And so that's that's probably the most expensive pool in Beverly Hills. Wow, Pat O'Brien, you're up. Then Barry Keating. <laughs> well, thanks. Um, actually, my question was about the relationship with Red Skelton, but you've kind of already addressed that. And uh, in the in the movie The Cameraman, which I thought was actually a very interesting movie, although uh, you indicated it didn't turn enough revenues given the expenses. Mm -hmm. um, I understood that movie was used often by MGM as a model of how comedy should be done. But do you have any, is that true or do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I don't know. I think it was available for a long time for people to run if they wanted to watch it in the studio. I know that um, uh, when they were preparing Singing in the Rain, they ran a lot of silent films and uh, that was one of them. I know that the, uh, uh, Condon and Green uh, uh, saw, watched that film because uh, Adolph Green told that to a mutual friend uh, that uh, uh, they, had, they had examined the cameraman. And uh, so it was available. I don't know if everybody had to sit down and were forced to watch it. I, I think that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but uh, uh, I, I, th I think it was always regarded as a, a very, very good film. And I think it, uh, Thalberg thought it was hilarious. He, he liked the film a great deal. Uh, but uh, 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 I, th I think it was, uh, I think it was a film that was always respected and uh, uh, known about. And so I have no doubt that a lot of people ran it um, over the years. I'll tell you one thing that's interesting about Red Skelton. Uh, I saw a transcript of a taped interview the Red Skelton did with a friend of his, the author Gene Fowler. And it may have been that Red Skelton was contemplating letting Fowler write a biography of him because that's what Fowler did in those days. Uh, and this was a very, very unvarnished interview. I mean, very frank, extremely frank. And 
uh, Skelton would talk about how, for instance, if uh, certain uh, performers got out of hand, that uh, the studio would hire a prostitute and uh, send send her over to them and, and calm them down a bit. I guess the the, the line that Skelton uses buy them a good time. And uh, anyway, Skelton, Skelton confided to Gene Fowler he never thought Buster Keaton was funny. But uh, Buster was one of the architects of his success in the 1940s at MGM. Barry Keating, you're up. Uh, hi, um, I just wanted to thank you for, I thought I knew a lot about Buster Keaton. I'm a huge fan and I'm finding out all kinds of uh, things I had no idea. I wanted to ask you uh, specifically uh, how, you found out about the vaudeville act because I've I've heard about it for so many years and mm -hmm. just they just say oh, it was tough and rough and tumble but you described it uh, exactly what it was and it also its evolution could you um, tell me a bit about that and also just your research in general mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, fortunately, there are some eyewitness accounts of the act at various points in its uh, development. And uh, one of the great resources I used was uh, the Society for the Prevention, the New York Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, uh, which was the organization that was giving the Keaton such trouble back in the, at the turn of the century. And uh, they still exist and they have a complete archive. So you can go back and as I did, I, could, I handled the uh, actual letters that Joe Keaton wrote to them. Um, and I also looked at the reports that uh, their various officers uh, submitted that uh, described the act because they were in the audiences uh, auditing the act and seeing what the kids were made to do. Because um, as Buster once explained, uh, they had a law in the books in the state of New York where you could not, uh, uh, any kid under 16 could not be used in a lot of very specifically specified performance ways. Like for instance, they could not sing, they could not dance, they were not supposed to emote in a dramatic scene, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They couldn't juggle. Uh, this was all laid out explicitly. Uh, but Joe Keaton saw uh, uh, an out there. He saw a, a, a loophole, so to speak. Uh, it didn't say anywhere that you couldn't throw the kid into the scenery. And Joe took it so far, for instance, he had a, a, a luggage handle sewn into the back of Buster's costume so he could just pick him up by the handle and throw him. Uh, so that's, that's what he used back then. He would say, show me where it says I can't do that. And, uh, and so, but then they said, well, he, that makes him a skilled acrobat. And Joe would say, no skill involved whatsoever. Watch this, you know. And of course it was skilled. Of course it was skilled. But uh, Joe was able to finesse that uh, many times. And uh, he got arrested a couple of times. But uh, it was for putting kids on stage necessarily, not, not necessarily because he was uh, apparently abusing them in some ways. But uh, uh, I do not believe that Buster Keaton was an abused child. Uh, Buster always denied it. Uh, logic uh, tells you that, well, here's the thing that was acknowledged very early on was Buster was the star of the act. And uh, he was, they were told multiple times by various managers that they would never book the act if Buster wasn't part of it because it was a lousy act otherwise. So uh, there was never any intent to hurt Buster or injure him in any way because if Buster didn't work, the act didn't work. It was that simple. Uh, Buster maintained that he and his father were the best of friends right up to the late end of his life. And he never wavered from that. And his father was in a lot of his films, a lot of his feature films, you can see Joe Keaton. Uh, he was in sh short films uh, with Buster. Joe was all around uh, the studio when he was at MGM, uh, et cetera. And Joe came to dinner every Sunday at the house, uh, right up to the time, pretty much close to when he died in 1946. So. Uh, they had a warm relationship. Uh, they had a rupture during the time when Joe was drinking a lot. Uh, and that's when Buster broke up the act. But uh, uh, as, as he said on the Today Show in 1963, uh, we were the best of friends and he meant it. He was serious. Here's a question. Uh, one of the things you had talked about in the book and uh, one that I read about, that people like Mel Brooks went back and essentially said, without, without Buster Keaton, there would have been no Mel Brooks movies. Walk us through who else, I mean, 
Mel Bro who Buster Keaton was able to influence. And in the case of Brooks, Brooks was able to, to be there while he was still alive. I, yeah. I think, uh, yeah. So walk us through how well, you know, the influences has, has continued. I, I, I know one of the regrets of Peter Bogdanovich was that he didn't take the opportunity to tell Buster Keaton how much he appreciated his work when he had the chance. Because Buster was working on the Beach Party films when Peter was at uh, American International. Uh, there were people who did get to express their admiration, and especially toward the end of the end of his life, when uh, his films were being seen again. Uh, one of the things that surprised me about uh, Keaton and his life was that for a long period, going up until oh, the latter '60s, people couldn't see most of his films. Uh, today, you know, you, you can stream them on YouTube. You can go out and buy DVDs and Blu-rays of them. Back then, you couldn't. Uh, you had to go to the Museum of Modern Art in New York, or you had to go to a museum that had borrowing privileges. Uh, it, they were just very tough to see. So Keaton was kind of a legend, but uh, a legend for which there was not a lot of evidence. And uh, when those films started to be seen again is when Keaton really, um, uh, I think, uh, uh, got his due, so to speak, uh, especially the last year of his life when he went to, say, for instance, the Venice Film Festival. Two seasons earlier, they had done a complete Keaton retrospective. And so a lot of the audience, when he showed up uh, one night on the uh, mezzanine level, he was guest of honor, and um, people started to applaud. And he sat down and uh, right at the lip of the uh, the the uh, mezzanine and uh, he could hear the applause and he said to his wife who are they applauding for and she said you and by this point people were on their feet they were standing on on seats uh, uh, and the applause went on and on and on and there was a point where he stood up and just looked around he was in amazement he couldn't understand it and someone snapped a picture of him just looking bewildered what are they applauding for and uh, uh, I've got that shot in my book. Uh, yeah. But uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, everybody who's had the chance since that time to sample the Keaton works uh, cannot help but be influenced as they work in the field of comedy. I, I haven't met anybody who doesn't admire and see Buster Keaton as a strong influence. And uh, Mel Brooks, who did a lot with physical comedy, would certainly understand that. Peter Bogdanovich, I think, was a brilliant guy when it came to staging and coordinating physical comedy and uh, was able to uh, uh, study Keaton's work as well as his notebook show. Uh, and uh, I think that's true. Quentin Tarantino is another one that uh, reveres Keaton. Uh, Skelton was certainly influenced by Keaton, although he would probably deny it. Uh, he... he pretended at one time that he didn't realize that Keaton was uh, working on his feature films. I, I don't believe that. Um, it's hard to think of somebody who wouldn't have been influenced by Buster Keaton because of his, the sheer mastery of his body and uh, um, the body of his work as well. Ron Young, you're up. But Jim, why did Buster's fortunes fail in the second half of his career? Uh, well, he was overextended in a lot of ways. He was trying to keep his wife happy, who was kind of in a, a prestige race with her two sisters, who were both movie stars. And so she needed progressively larger houses. And so he was living beyond his means. Uh, he was a salaried employee at MGM getting 3000 a week. Uh, very good money during the Depression, of course. I, I'm not denying that. But everything that came in went out again. He was a cash flow wonder. And uh, so he wasn't putting any of it away. He wasn't investing successfully. He owned some property, but that's about it. Uh, so when he lost the income from MGM, uh, he went broke very quickly. And then he had to essentially dig himself out of that hole. And it took a long time to do it. Thanks. Here, here, here's a quick question. You know, there are certain actors who are they manage their persona. Mm -hmm. And for those of us like Lisa and myself who grew up in Rochester, New York, Louise Brooks was always not too far away from the Eastman house. 
And uh, we would see her on occasion. And we were shocked that this was, oh my God, this is a silent era heroine. <laughs> and, but walk us through how uh, Buster kept his, or at least worked to keep his popularity going. I mean, this stuff doesn't happen naturally. Yes, you have talent, but it also takes efforting on the part of somebody to keep him in the public eye. How much of that was him? How much of that was his third wife too? Well, she created a place for him that was safe. I, I don't necessarily think he would have seen it exactly that way, but she made, she made it uh, possible for him to function uh, in a very real sense. Uh, she took away his reasons for drinking as much as he used to. I mean, he had plenty of reason to drink in the early thirties and he ended up in a, in a straight jacket as a re result. But uh, later on, uh, she, there were times when he would uh, uh, fall off the wagon, but uh, he was a binge drinker, so uh, he would usually have a reason, a, a trigger for that to occur. Um, but I think that uh, uh, he had that great face, and he always looked like Buster Keaton. That was a big deal. Um, and television came on; it came along at just the right time, so that he could. Uh, be seen again by massive audiences uh, doing what he did best. Um, he would go on the Ed Sullivan show, for instance, and do a six or seven minute pantomime, uh, bring the house down in effect. And Sullivan was a Broadway columnist in the years when Keaton was on stage and on screen and fully respected what he did. And it's interesting, if you watch the original Sullivan appearance in 1950, and you could tell how much respect uh, Ed Sullivan had for him. Uh, and that's available for viewing at the Paley Center for Media. Uh, and he says to his audience, this is Toast of the Town, which is the name of the show at the time. He said, uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, of course, but the next man you're going, I'm going to introduce uh, is a great comedian, one of the greatest comedians who ever lived. And you, you youngsters won't know who he was, but uh, you older folks will definitely know who he was and you will be delighted to be seeing him again. And he said, I want you to give him the biggest round of applause you've ever given anybody in your life for Mr. Buster Keaton. And he brings Buster Keaton. Uh, that's an unusual, very unusual uh, introduction for Ed Sullivan to do, but, but that's the breadth and width of his respect for Buster. And it was shared by a lot of people. And um, so television made him very visible again. And because television made him very visible, uh, he started appearing in films again. And so you see him in Around the World in 80 Days and you see him in It's a Mad, 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 Mad World. And you see him in the beach party pictures. He was a, a figure that, uh, or in a face, I should say, uh, that even kids knew. And uh, so a lot of it was luck and timing and the fact that Buster remained healthy enough to continue to work right up until the day he died, practically. Okay, who's up next? Ron, you're up, and I'll ask a question. Jim, how long did it take to make movies in those days, a regular full-length movie? How long were they, and how long were their production cycles? Well, uh, uh, there's a difference between the independent films, which took a while. Uh, he could knock off a two reeler in about four weeks, roughly. Uh, when he got into features, I think the general took six weeks to make six. To, no, wait, pardon me. I'll take that back. Nine weeks. Um, some of them took less time than that. Um, he wasn't really worried about his schedule. Film was cheap back then. He said the, the, all of our people were on salary, so they were available whenever you needed them. We owned our own cameras, et cetera. Uh, at MGM, typically the schedules for his talkies were 30, 35 days. Um, I think, I think the, the cameraman initially was 30 days, and they kept revising the schedule because they kept going back and reshooting things. I think the cameraman ended up being 62 days. Um, the exact figure is in the book, I, but I, I think it's around 62 days. Um, so the comedies took longer, as I mentioned, than uh, uh, the dramas for the most part, um, but they took anywhere from, uh, well, then when they, they lowered the boom a bit, he did Spite Marriage, that did take 30 days. Uh, so it depended, it really depended, but uh, generally speaking, a month to six weeks. What was he like to work for? How what was his relationship with colleagues like? 
Uh, very, very good. I mean, they would take take time off for lunch, pull the uh, window shades down, and open some beers, uh, have lunch together, uh, go back to work uh, afterwards. Um, someone who was a writer with him said, "Buster was a great guy to work with, not for. You didn't work for Buster; you worked with Buster, and the crew was dedicated to him." Walk us through the beach movies toward the end of his life. I mean, I, how much of that was William Asher saying, I want Buster to be in the movies? And walk us through the relationship with, with Samuel Arkoff, who was one of the prototypical, almost cliched style Hollywood mogul types, complete with the, you know, the cigar in his mouth. Yeah, you know. Uh, I don't know that he ever met Arkoff, possibly. I, I, I know that Asher was the one that wanted him in the initial film. No, no, wait a second. I take that back. The initial film was Pajama Party, and that was not directed by Asher. That was directed by Don Weiss. Asher did the next one after that. Um, it was uh, a writer named Deke Hayward who came from television who wrote Pajama Party, which was uh, one of the beach party derivatives. And he wrote a part for Buster, and it was um, uh, he played an Indian in it. Uh, in uh, what would today be referred to as cultural appropriation. He was known as Chief Rotten Eagle, I think was his name. And it was just a broad, broad part that uh, had really very little uh, in it that required his great talents. But uh, he liked the idea of the paycheck. He was on for six weeks on that film and probably walked away with, you know, five, six thousand dollars for it. And they got it, his name and his face in it. And uh, his leading lady in those films was a, a beautiful blonde named Bobby Shaw. And uh, she uh, she didn't realize who he was at the time, but she's still with us. And we're doing a Keaton afternoon at the Hollywood Heritage Museum across from uh, Hollywood Bowl on April 10th, and Bobby Shaw is going to join us that day. So uh, if you're in the area and would like to meet Bobby Shaw and talk to her firsthand about the uh, Beach Party films, uh, there she is. She was in a lot of them. Now, I almost want to ex expand the question a little bit to include Jeff Joseph as well. To a larger question is, is Hollywood doing a good job restoring and saving some of those older films? Not just with Keaton, but with Keaton's generation. And I'll defer to Jeff because Jeff's done a tremendous job mm -hmm. with the preservation of Laurel and Hardy. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've had a chance to go see the, the re-premieres of those. And I'll open that one up to, I'll also open that up to uh, Carrie if she's still with us. To get an idea if, you know, she, I, I'm sorry, she had to drop off. Yeah. But um, thoughts? I think each of these were, were, had their own little horror stories. I mean, Laurel and Hardy were Hal Roach. Hal Roach was an operator. He sold rights over and over again. The stuff got scattered to the winds. Nobody really took care of it. Keaton is kind of different. I mean, I think, uh, Jim, you can probably tell the, the, the Raymond Rohauer story much better than I can, can tell. Oh, God, that gets awfully complicated, Jeff. We don't want to get down the weeds too much, but... Uh, oh, why not? Let's go for it. <laughs> well, Rohauer, as it turned out, uh, was a guy who lusted for his name being out there. And one of the ways that he wanted to do this was to um, control a lot of valuable films and he would put his name on them. Raymond Rohauer presents. And uh, he was running a repertory theater here in Los Angeles, the Coronet, which is still there. Uh, as a matter of fact, on, uh, what is it? It's on- uh, uh, La Cienega? Or La Cienega, that's it. I'm sorry, I, it went, went out of my mind all of a sudden. Uh, and um, anyway, one night in the late 1950s, Buster said to his wife, Eleanor, uh, I hear they're running the general at the Coronet Theater, and she had never seen it. And so he took her to see it. And he <clears throat> walked into the lobby, and um, immediately it became known that uh, Johnny Gray was in the house. And um, so Raymond Rohauer came down from the projection booth and says, I need to talk to you afterwards. And so they ran the film and he uh, questioned Keaton afterwards, do you have any of your films, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so that was the start of it. And over a period of time, Rohauer set up a new version of Buster Keaton Productions Incorporated, which was uh, which Buster was the president and Eleanor was the secretary, as I remember. And uh, 
um, they were going to use that as an entity to uh, pursue copyrights on uh, the silent features and Rohauer was going to uh, restore them and, uh, and uh, market them. And the basis for a lot of the first films that Rohauer had was uh, uh, the James Mason purchase of the old Buster Keaton uh, estate because Buster, yeah. when he built the estate, had a uh, vault, a film vault built into the side of a, of a hill uh, to store his, his film. So he had his personal prints of all the features and some of the short subjects there. And um, so Mason at one point hired a locksmith to come out and open the thing. And there were all the Buster Keaton reels. And because it was considered abandoned property, he was the legal owner of them. And so rather than give them the Buster, he felt that Buster didn't have any way of preserving them himself. And this is before Rohauer was on the scene. He turned them over to the Motion Picture Academy and the Academy had them. Then Raymond Rohauer came along, they formed this company and then Raymond Rohauer went to the Academy and said, I'm representing Buster Keaton and Buster Keaton would like to see these films again. May we borrow them so he can see, see them. And they knew that something fishy was up but they couldn't come up with any legitimate reason to deny Buster Keaton uh, the ability to see these films. And so they reluctantly loaned them to Rohauer and Rohauer immediately took them to a lab and had them copied. And that became the basis of what he uh, eventually owned uh, were these prints that Buster Keaton had kept uh, in this vault dating back to the twenties. Um, and over time, there were two basic sets of films. One was one were the ones that the copyrights had been renewed and there was still a ghost entity of Buster Keaton Productions Incorporated, the original company from the 1920s, still in existence in New York and they claimed the copyrights. And then there was another group the copyrights had lapsed on like the general for instance was in the public domain at that point. So Rohauer A wanted to gain control of the copyright at once and B create copyright with the uh, the ones that had fallen out of copyright. Pretend copyrights, yes. That was yeah. Rohauer's specialty, pretend copyrights. Right, pretend copyrights. And he, <laughs> he, he used a phony publication dates, as you know, Jeff, to yep. do that. Yep. And uh, so I've, I've got the story in the book probably as detailed and accurate as ever been told because I had uh, the great benefit of being able to see the Academy archive file on, on the James Mason. Oh, documents. great. And so there was a lot of correspondence between Raymond Rohauer and Margaret Herrick about, about this. And it was very contentious from time to time. Um, but anyway, anyway, uh, over time, Rohauer hit on the idea of recutting the Buster Keaton films and putting new titles on them and musical scores and then copywriting those elements as improvements. And so that's what he did. He, he submitted them. He sent prints, 16 millimeter prints to the copyright office and then started to go out and sue everybody who had prints or who presumed to uh, show prints of these films. And that included Pauline Kael, who was running the Film Society in Berkeley at, at that point. And, uh, and he went after her too. Uh, so it was a long process. Now the Rohauer Holdings belong to Cohen Media and uh, the last of them, uh, Battling Butler, went public domain at the beginning of this year. But they have very good prints because they had the Keaton prints. Um, Did the yeah, negatives ever show up for that stuff or just those prints? Apparently, I'm told that the negative to uh, 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 General exists. And I don't know which other ones there are that actually exist. I hear occasionally mention, as I'm sure you do, of... Uh, uh, camera negatives on some of this stuff and some of it looks awfully good um the other great restoration entity for the keaton films is lobster in france yeah and, absolutely uh, and when we do the um i'm, I'm going to uh, new york on wednesday and introduce a 10 program series at film forum and those are all going to be restored robbed lobster prints and uh they'll run the general and our hospitality and go west and the others uh, so the two great entities that are restoring and preserving the Buster Keaton heritage at this point are Cohen through ownership and Lobster through dedication. 
Yeah, I work with, with Serge Bromberg on some of the Laurel Hardy material as well. Absolutely. He's a great guy. He's a great guy. He is indeed and very committed to what he does. And uh, uh, I, salute, uh, I salute him. And I'm looking forward to seeing the quality of the work he does. Very good. And the follow-up question to you both would be, is there any lost Buster Keaton stuff that has been found recently? And is there any idea of other stuff that might be out there? Well, there's a lot of television material. I posted a couple things on YouTube over the last it year. It was so. great. Jeff, talk about it. Talk about the one thing you posted about a week ago, about two weeks ago. I think three, three comedians. Me, three comedians, I think. No. You that, that yes. interview from 1962. On Canadian uh, Broadcasting. From Canadian Broadcasting. I posted that. I've also got access to some of the Buster Keaton television shows from the 1950s that were done locally, I believe at KTLA. Uh -huh. And they're being scanned now. And I'll get those up on YouTube in the next month or two, I hope. How, how many of those do you have? I want to say three or four, but honestly, I, I, I sent so much material, I can't swear to that. But there was there was a batch of those. There's also a, a feature that was done in England based on the Bust to Keep television shows. Well, um, now, are, are those, are now you're talking about live shows? Uh, yeah, the, the live okay. shows. So those the are kind of scopes, yeah. Yes, correct. Um, now, now. I ran across a guy who was a collector a couple of years ago. He introduced himself, and he claimed that he had uh, one of the live Buster Keaton show kinescopes, and the guest star is Dorothy Sebastian. Is that I one? Of you? I truly don't know. I, I, okay. I shipped them off to be scanned without really going through them, so I, I can't tell you. When I get Buster, them back, I'll let you know. Yeah, Buster, Buster had a ten-year relationship with the actress Dorothy Sebastian, and they appeared together in *Spite Marriage* and did this classic routine where she's dead drunk and he's trying to put her to bed in a nice way. And uh, uh, it's an act that he was able to perform with Eleanor and others uh, up to the end of his life, practically. There was an appearance, that's I think, on Circus World, a circus show that uh, oh, yeah, he did. Oh yeah, that's, yeah that's, that's, that's been on YouTube. Circus yeah, I've got, I've got a kind of scope of that, which is being scanned. Yeah. There's the three comedians. One. There's, a, there's about five or six other pieces that I'll be getting up on YouTube during the year, I think. The thing you learn about three comedians, uh, or I, because I, I saw it years ago, uh, it was a Paley. I think Paley has it. Yeah, they do. Yeah, and they have a Today Show as well. But uh, the interesting thing about three comedians is that you get to see a glimpse of Buster's passion for what he did uh, and how seriously he took it. And one of the reasons for that is he's beyond among peers. He's 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 talking with uh, the show's host. He's also talking with Bert Lahr, and he's talking with um, Eddie Foy Jr. And Bert Lahr and the chemistry goes back and forth between Bert Lahr and Buster Keaton uh, is really quite interesting. And the fact that they they cl clearly great respect toward Buster and what he achieved and what he was able to do. Um, and Bert Lahr is apparently a lot more talkative than uh, he usually was. I, I sent it over to um, Connie Booth, who did a couple of uh, stage productions with Bert Lahr years before she married his son. And uh, she said he talks more on this than I ever heard, heard him speak in real life. <laughs> so, but, but that's, I think Buster brought him out in effect. So it's interesting for Bert Lahr as well as for Buster Keaton, but that's a fascinating piece of film. You're muted, Bob. Sorry. Ah, now I'm, I'm calling them myself. Now that's the same Connie Booth who would be in Faulty uh, Towers. Yeah, Faulty Towers, and I think was with uh, John Cleese at one point for a while. She was married to him. Ah. Before we go, we got time for one more question. Who wants to answer? Who wants to ask? Or I'll jump in. Frederick, sure. you have an ask. You're up. And then Ron. One. Frederick, then Ron. So, uh, Jim, if you had to go to a desert island and you could only have three Buster Keaton films, what are your absolute personal favorites? Uh, I'm, I've been running them. We just did uh, a couple of shows uh, at American Cinema Tech, and I'm going to be introducing the same films in New York. Um, the three I'm introducing, I think, would be Mike. Well, no, wait, I'll take that back. Uh, I'm introducing Go West, which I feel very strongly about, and people haven't seen that to the extent they've seen some of the others, and so I'm very happy to be showing that to people. Uh, Our Hospitality, which uh, I think is a wonderful film and an amazing feature debut for Buster Keaton, and I maintain it's a feature debut. He did a previous feature, but Buster very deliberately uh, uh, shot it essentially as three two real short subjects that he put together, uh, and uh, our hospitality is a remarkable leap in te technique forward uh, from three ages. The third one I think I would pick would be Seven Chances. And that was the first Keaton feature I ever saw with uh, 
a live audience and uh, live music. And uh, it just blew me away. Ron Young, you're up. So uh, did Buster have an international following? Beyond America, where else was he popular? Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, for a long time, uh, his revenues from the rest of the world uh, were about the same as from the US. Uh, there were places in Europe where he was just as popular as Chaplin. Uh, and uh, I, think, I think that remained the case even into his talky years. Um, but no, he was extremely popular. And when he needed work and uh, went back to work in a big way in the late 40s, uh, he went to France and appeared for uh, the, the Cirque de Grano uh, several times and uh, was a big, big success over there. Uh, he did television in England. Uh, he did television in, um, no, he did live appearances in Germany. Um, he told a story one time, this is in fact on the, the Kinescope from the Today Show, um, where he was asked to do a TV appearance in Germany in Berlin. And he didn't have his uh, pork pie hat with him. So he said, okay, okay I'm going to have to make one before I can go on the air. And so he went across the street to a hat shop, uh, picked out a hat that would work, uh, checked on the price of it. It was a rather expensive hat. He paid for it. He just held out the money in his hand like, like Americans do a lot of times. And they just took what they, they, they needed. And then he asked for a pair of scissors. And they were kind of flabbergasting one of the pair of scissors, but they gave it to him. And so he immediately tore out the lining inside the hat. Then he trimmed around the, uh, the uh, brim, uh, cut it down. Uh, they're watching this in horror because they, they couldn't imagine someone buying a brand new nice hat like that and then doing this to it. And uh, finally, it's done the way it needs to be. And he puts it on his head and they all go, oh, booster. They didn't recognize until he put on the hat. So, yeah, no, he did have a following around the world. He had names everywhere that they called him by, uh, especially in Europe. He was extremely popular and still is. Great story. And this is great. And we're going to wrap things up very quickly. What I mean, the nice thing about the Lunch and Society is we can take something like the entertainment industry and slice it into a variety of, of pies. You know, within, within the entertainment industry, we had, let's see, Roger Ebert on, on Critique. We had um, Larry Terman on the uh, on the 50th anniversary of The Graduate, mm -hmm. and he told all, all sorts of Samuel Arkoff stories that could have taken up two hours. And we had um, oh we oh geez Lawrence uh, uh, well, I'm blanking right here. Um, I do that a lot. I mean we we've done about seven or eight different gatherings, and it's, and it's great because it really allows. Everybody to uh, Lawrence Cass, and that's what I was thinking about. We did Dick Cabot. We did have Cabot, and that was fun. And Cabot would come now and then, and that and and, and that and that was, and he's always fun. Mm -hmm. And oh, um, Zweibel, huh? Zweibel. Zweibel is fun, and he we, we just had him for. Uh, he just joined us for Joyce Carol Oates two weeks ago, and I'm getting the books out as soon as we're done here. But here's what's coming up. We've got. Um, We've got a kind of a semi-private soccer luncheon. If you're if you are into the beautiful game, let me know. But the next two big ones are uh, Dean Ornish on his on his book on his classic book on nutrition, and the Academy Awards one, which will be after that, which will be with Leonard Moulton. And we will fight. We will throw furniture, throw plates as we argue over who should be uh, who should earn the statue. But more importantly, I'm curious why the uh, <clears throat> why the, uh, the Academy has given the short shrift to some of the, I'd like to say accessible awards. And that's, and that's maybe a story for another day. But I wanna thank everybody for coming and have a great afternoon. Thanks. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. All right, take care now. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Bob. Thank, thank you. Great, Jim. Thank you. Great.